Good morning. And welcome to worship here at St. Andrews. Glad we can gather together. Also, welcome to those of you who are worshiping online this morning or whenever it is that you are viewing this. Uh, please do leave a message in the comments and know that you are always welcome to worship anytime in person if it works for you, any Sunday morning at 9 o'clock or Wednesday evening at 6 o'clock. Also, a note for you online, we are celebrating the Sacrament of Communion. And if you'd like to take part in that, gather some bread and some wine or some grape juice. I want to welcome also any guests or visitors who might be among us this morning. Thank you for choosing to worship here at St. Andrew's this morning, and thank you for blessing us with your presence. Would everyone who is here in person please take a moment now and fill out the friendship pad, which should be at the end, uh, one of the ends of the pews. Uh, members, fill it out as completely as you can. It's a great model for our guests and visitors as well. Uh, thank you also for those of you who are wearing your name tags. If you are a regular attendee of this congregation, whether you're a member or just a, a regular attendee, you should probably have a name tag. If you do not, if you lost yours, or if you never had one, please request one from the uh, church office, and Doreen will be happy to make you a name tag. A couple of announcements. Tomorrow evening, there is a concert here at St. Andrews. Two choirs will be joining together. It's Oak Grove Lutheran High School from Fargo, and Grand Rapids High School a cappella choir will be in concert here, 7 o'clock tomorrow evening. Next Sunday, so this coming Sunday, there is a fundraiser concert and meal for the youth from Zion and St. Andrews together who are going to the ELCA Youth Gathering this summer. It's uh, at Zion next Sunday. So there are tickets that are on sale uh, in the fellowship hall for you to, to purchase. If you're not able to make it or if you are able to make it also, we're looking for... Uh, items for a bake sale or silent auction. So if you'd like to contribute uh, something along those lines, looks like Kim wants to say something to me. Hey, Kit. No, no, stop. Start over. Start over. We're recording and no one can hear you. So our Grand Rapids High School Jazz Band is playing at the concert and we have several members here in our church that are part of that jazz band so dane allen is part of it my son casey cowan is in there Alyssa bolan is in here is in there um, both the grossland boys and connor swanson so we have a lot of um, kiddos that are in our church that are involved in that it's 15 dollars per person there's a silent auction there's a bake sale that you can um, contribute to as part of the congregation if you'd like to and we will be having some not so spicy jambalaya because some of us can't do that. Um, but there will be hot sauce, there'll be um, pulled pork sandwiches, there'll be an ice cream bar for kids, um, fruit and veggies. So please try to attend if you can or spread the word if you can't. Thank you. Perfect, she knows more than I do. You got the whole scoop there. Turning to worship now. During this season of Easter, the liturgy we are going to be using is setting number two in the Cranberry Colored Hymnal. So it might be new to you as it is relatively new to me as well. So let's hang in there and together we're going to learn this uh, setting of the communion liturgy. Today we get to enjoy the gift of music from our handbell choir under the direction of Cassie Thune. So thank you for that. Let's see, everything that you need for worship will be projected in front of you with the exception of the notes of a couple of the hymns. Those hymn numbers will be listed on the screen. The lyrics will be there. The numbers will be there if you want to follow along in the Cranberry Color Hymnal. And finally, no matter where you are in your journey of life and faith, please know that you are always welcome here at St. Andrews, just that so you are always welcomed unconditionally into the loving embrace of Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship. Please stand and join in singing the opening hymn number 363, Come You Faithful, Raise the Strain.
If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Trusting in God's mercy, let us confess our sin. You have shown yourself to us by word and spirit, with signs and wonders in flesh and blood. Yet we still struggle to live and believe the good news of Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us. Forgive us and cast out our fear so that we may come to trust in you and have life in Jesus' name. Amen. We have an advocate with God, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, who offered his life and love to save the world from sin. This is the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Now, just a word about this, the hymn of praise. Uh, Jan is going to play the refrain through once, then I'm going to sing the refrain through once, and then, I'll join, then I invite you to join in that refrain, and then we're going to plow our way through it. I mean, we're going to learn our way through it. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Together. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. The Lamb who was slain, whose blood set us free to be people of God. Power, riches, wisdom, and strength, and honor, blessing, and glory are His. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. Alleluia, alleluia. Sing with all the people of God and join in the hymn of all creation. Blessing, honor, glory, and might be to God and the Lamb forever. Amen. This is the feast of victory for our God. For the Lamb who was slain has begun his reign. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Together, let us pray. Almighty God, with joy we celebrate the day of our Lord's resurrection. By the grace of Christ among us, enable us to show the power of the resurrection in all that we say and do. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, everyone. I'm Betsy. I am the lead of children's ministries here at St. Andrews. If there's any kiddos, which I know there are, come on up. While they're coming up, I wanted to lift up a couple things. Um, one, thank you to everyone who helped out with the Easter breakfast. Um, it was a huge success and a learning experience, as all things are for me this year. And um, I just appreciate so much everybody's help from the kids to the adults, 
the, the littles making decorations for us. It was a huge help. Um, and also, we just had a lock-in this weekend with the high schoolers, and I want you all to know what amazing high schoolers we have in this church. They were just awesome, respectful, responsible, and I just want to thank everyone for helping with everything that everybody helps with in um, Children's Mysteries. So thank you all so much for that. And now, good morning, everybody. How are you all? Good? Did you all have a good Easter? I saw some of you. Some of you were out of the country. <laughs> um, so today, we're going to talk about um, believing. Uh, has anybody um, not been believed about something before? Like you've said something and they're like, I don't believe you. Yeah, you have? And, and how did that make you feel to not be believed? Mad? Thumbs down, okay, thumbs down, thumbs sideways, like kind of maybe frustrated or sad, yeah. Um, how do you feel when people do believe you or believe in you? Good, thumbs up, yeah, it, it's a good feeling. Um, well, what if I, I'm going to show you something, <clears throat> I'm going to show you this picture. Hey, Kev, can you look at this picture? What do you notice about this picture? arrows. Okay. What if I told you that these lines are the same length? Would you believe me? Yes. You would? <laughs> they see right see through no. me. How about these lines? Do you think those are the same or different? Kevin, can you sit down so George can see? Please? Thank you. Well, now you can't see. <laughs> you think they're the same or different? Do you think they're different? Okay. How about these dots, these red dots in the middle? Do you think they're different or same? Different? Okay. How about these lines, the lines going this way, horizontal? Do you think those are the same, like straight or different or wavy? Different. Different? All right. Well, I have something to show you. I brought a ruler. So... We can see that this first line is about that long, and the second line is the same length. They were the same, okay? You guys thought they were the same, but these ones you thought were different, right? So let's see. There's that one, and there's that one, about an inch and a half each. They're the same. How about that? Do you guys want to change your answer on these ones now? Yeah. yeah? Do you think they're the same or different? All right. Well, let's see. I've got my fingers here. Right there. Right there. They're the same. And these lines. Kevin, can I please have my ruler back? Thank you. Look at that. They're straight. They look curvy, though, don't they? So today we're going to learn a lesson about one of Jesus' disciples named Thomas. <clears throat> now, Jesus' disciples, who were his disciples? Like, they were, did they know him pretty well? And they spent a lot of time with him, right? Even one of his disciples didn't believe when the other guys told him that Jesus had risen. Yeah, there's a ladybug. How do you think Jesus would have felt about that? And the other disciples not being believed. Do you think the other disciples were like, come on, man, believe us. Yeah. We saw him. But Thomas said, no, nah, I don't believe you. I'm not going to believe you until I see him for myself. And you know what? I think it's an important story in the Bible because I've met people who are like, why do you believe all this stuff? I don't know, I, I don't know that I believe it. Or sometimes even myself. We all have doubts sometimes, right? And I think it's an important story in the Bible because it tells us that even one of Jesus' very best friends... The bug is trying to get out of church. Is he trying to get out? Maybe you can pick him up. Yeah. Even one of Jesus' very best friends had doubts. And Jesus told him, come here, come see, believe. And we have that story in the Bible to remind us that 
it's, you know what, sometimes we have doubts, but we have the whole Bible that has lots and lots of stories to tell us that it's real. It's, it's what happened. So I'm really grateful for that. We're going to learn more about that today in Sunday school after we watch the bell choir. We're going to stick around for that, okay? So we'll stay seated after we pray. You can find a spot that you can see better maybe, okay? And um, then we'll go back to Sunday school and they're done. So let's pray real quick. Everybody hands in. <clears throat> Come on in. Don't squish that ladybug. Okay, we won't squish the ladybug. All right, hands in. Loving Jesus, thank you for showing us every day that you are alive. That you are alive. Help us to know your presence and help us to share the wonder of your love with others. In your name we pray. Ready? Amen. Okay, now find a seat that you can see the handbells, okay? I'm going to scooch back a little bit because I can't see.
We continue with the Bible readings. The first reading is from Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to 35. While the apostles testified to others about the resurrection of Jesus, the early Christian community shared what they owned or sold their possessions to help their fellow believers who were in need. A reading from Acts. Now the whole group of those who believe were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions. But everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as as any had need. The word of the Lord. The second reading is from 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through chapter 2, verse 2. The opening of this letter serves as a reality check. The reality of God is light, but our confessed reality has been sin. God cleanses us from our sinful reality through Christ's death so that we live in fellowship with Christ and walk in God's light. A reading from 1 John. And I read this during the week, and it was familiar, but it didn't quite sink in. Today, when I read it, it did. Pay attention to the last line. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at, and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. His life was revealed, and we have seen it and testified to it, and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us, And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have No sin. We deceive ourselves, and the truth isn't in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just 
will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have sinned, we make him a liar and the world, and the word is not in us. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not for ours alone only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the gospel acclamation. The Holy Gospel according to John, the 20th chapter. It was still the first day of the week. That evening, while the disciples were behind closed doors because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities, Jesus came and stood among them. He said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. When the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they aren't forgiven. Thomas, the one called the twin, one of the twelve, wasn't with the disciples when Jesus came. The other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he replied, unless I see the nail marks in in his hands, put my finger in the wounds left by the nails, and put my hand into his side, I won't believe. After eight days, his disciples were again in a house, and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus entered and stood among them. He said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand into my side. No more disbelief. Believe. Thomas responded to Jesus, my Lord and my God. Jesus replied, do you believe because you see me? Happy are those who don't see and yet believe. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in his disciples' presence, signs that are not recorded in this scroll. But these things are written so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, God's Son, and that believing, you will have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. It's Easter again. At least it's Easter Sunday right now in our reading from the Gospel of John. It's the evening of Easter, and the disciples are huddled together. They're hiding together behind closed doors. And who could really blame them? It had been a tumultuous, strange week. It began with Jesus and the disciples entering the city of Jerusalem to shouts of Hosanna. And then things turned ominous, at least by Thursday. Thursday evening, the disciples and Jesus gathered for the Passover meal in the upper room. And Jesus said, 
this is my body given for you. What? And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. What? And then they went out to a garden to pray. That's nice. But then Jesus was arrested. And there was a trial of sorts. And the next day he was tortured and killed on a cross. And then making things oh so more confusing and strange, some of the women of their group had said that Jesus was alive. Jesus wasn't dead. They said that the tomb was empty, that they had actually seen and talked with Jesus, who was very much alive. Really? Oh, what should they believe? What should they do? They were understandably afraid, and they hid behind closed doors. And maybe that's what we often do as well. When, whenever it is that we're afraid, we get locked behind closed doors, or we lock ourselves in and the world and everyone out when we're afraid or threatened or grieving. It's not uncommon when we're emotionally stressed or distressed or depressed or frightened or threatened or challenged to shut ourselves off from the outside world. It's not uncommon for us to create our own tombs. But the good news, the good news is that a tomb never stopped Jesus. You see, in spite of the fact that the disciples were holed up in a tomb of their own making, in spite of the fact that they didn't really believe the women from their group, in spite of the fact that they had all deserted Jesus, Jesus came to them. Did you hear that? Jesus came to them. In the midst of their fears, Jesus miraculously slipped through their locked doors. Jesus breathed the breath of the Holy Spirit upon them and within them, empowering them to live, empowering them to go out and tell the good news, the good news that we have seen the Lord. Pastor and author Will Williman says this, another way of putting it, is that they could have said, the Lord didn't just rise from the dead. The Lord came to us. The Lord came to us. And that changed everything for them. But Thomas, Thomas wasn't there, and so he doubted. Yep, this is doubting Thomas, right? But in spite of Thomas' doubts, Jesus came to him. You get that? Jesus came to Thomas in spite of his doubts, in spite of it all, in the midst of his doubts, Jesus came to Thomas. And Jesus said, peace be with you, just like he had said to the gathered group of disciples the week prior. Now, Thomas could have said, the Lord didn't just rise from the dead. The Lord came to me. And that experience changed Thomas. He went on to confess, my Lord and my God. And what I want to say to you this morning is, Jesus still does that, meaning Jesus still comes to us. It's all about Jesus coming to us rather than us clawing our way or climbing our way to Jesus. It's about Jesus coming to us. And in the midst of everything, in spite of everything, Jesus comes to us. Jesus comes to us when you and I are afraid. Jesus comes to us when you and I doubt. Fear and doubt do not disqualify any of us from experiencing Jesus, from Jesus coming to us. 
I want to think a little bit with you about doubt. Every year, the first Sunday after Easter, we get this text of a doubting Thomas. And so you always look for a different angle on it, or, you know, it's one of those texts that come up all the time, and as a preacher, maybe I get tired of it. That might have been a confession. Um, this year, I've, I, I just have begun reading a book called Faith After Doubt. Faith After Doubt by an author by the name of Brian McLaren. And at least for me, in some sense, they seem to be related. Now, full disclosure, I'm only 53 pages into this book. For those of you who are here on Wednesday, that means I haven't read any more of it since Wednesday. Life gets in the way sometimes, folks. All right. Anyways, I'm only 53 pages in, but it seems to me <laughs> that this book addresses what happens to many Christians. Somewhere along the line, they begin to question, doubt, some of the things of the faith. Or some of the things of the Bible as they're exposed to other ways of thinking and other interpretations. Or maybe just as they begin to honestly, perhaps for the first time, honestly think things through. What do I mean? Uh, perhaps they were taught that the Bible is inerrant. And because the Bible is the inerrant Word of God, everything that is printed in the pages of the Bible is true and factual exactly like it says. For example, creation happened just like it says in the Bible. I'm a Bible-believing Christian. Until along the line someplace, you learn and dis or discover on your own that there are two creation stories in the Bible. And all of a sudden you're wondering, which one's true? And all of a sudden, there's a little crack in one of the bricks of the foundation of their faith. But it's not much. It's not much. Not much to worry about. They can ignore that one little thing. They can cling to the rest, the rest of the faith, the rest of the Bible. But then they're also taught, according to the Bible, that creation is about 10,000 years old. But then they took a class in high school. They seem to remember high school. Maybe it was a geology class. And geology tends to think that the world's a little bit older than 10,000 years. Millions. And then all this information that we're getting from these super telescopes. What was it? The first one was the, the web. And now it's the, no, the second one was we had the Hubble and all the James Webb telescopes, right? And the, the data that we're getting back from them suggests that, yes, the universe is millions, if not billions of years old. And all of a sudden, it's like, there's another little crack in another brick of that foundation of faith. And then with some more honest inquiry, perhaps, things just start snowballing. And they begin to question, might I say doubt, more and more. And, and, and by the way, how do you reconcile a God who in Scripture several times orders, commands, genocide? The complete, violent annihilation of a people. How do you reconcile that with Jesus? Have you ever had any of these types of questions? Might I say doubts? And as Christians, it can be unsettling to have those kind of questions. And for people who have never been part of the Christian faith, it can be, those questions can be barriers to ever being open to the Christian faith. McLaren makes the case in these very early pages of this book <laughs> for
for embracing these questions, for embracing doubts as a pathway to deeper faith in Jesus. Rather than suppressing doubt, he asserts that we should lean into it as a catalyst for transformation, as a way that we might begin to experience, oh yes, albeit a a more nuanced, but perhaps more mature and authentic faith. Or to bring this back to our text from John, as a way to begin again experiencing Jesus, who comes to us in the midst of our questions and doubt. And we may just discover that God is bigger than we had ever before imagined, something that we might have missed had we never doubted or wondered. You see, in this case, Doubt is not the enemy of faith, but rather a pathway to deeper understanding as questioners or doubters like you and me come to understand that our previous understanding of Scripture was perhaps limited and limiting, and that God, yes, is indeed bigger and more mysterious and more loving than we had ever imagined. In spite of, or perhaps Because of his doubts, Thomas had an experience of the risen and living Jesus. In spite of, or perhaps because of doubts that you and I and others have had, we might be more open to experiencing and seeing Jesus who comes to us, full of grace, full of love, full of compassion, inviting you and me to lives of grace and love and compassion, inviting you and me to declare with our words and with our actions that Jesus is Lord and God. And that can change everything for you and for others. Amen. I invite you to stand and join us singing the hymn number 635, We Walk by Faith.
rejoicing that Jesus is risen and love has triumphed over fear. Let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need of good news. Your church cries out, O God, and you listen. As you drew near to the disciples, draw near to us this day. Breathe on us your Holy Spirit, that our faith is renewed and we witness to your love. God of grace, your creation cries out, O God, and you listen. Nurture trees, crops, wildflowers, and all growing things. Guide farmers, gardeners, arborists, and others who tend the soil and nurture plants into life. God of grace, your world cries out, O God, and you listen. Guide police, firefighters, paramedics, and other first responders to work for the well-being of communities and the dignity of every person that no one may need to live in fear. God of grace, your children cry out, O God, and you listen. Hear your people crying out for justice for an end to racism and other oppression, for a world where all are fed and safe, for a world in which there is no more war. We pray for all who cry out in suffering or pain or illness for healing and wholeness, especially for those we name before you now either out loud or silently in our hearts. God of grace, accept our gratitude, O God, for the lives of those who now rest in you. Grant us your peace amid our fears. God of grace, into your hands, most merciful God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your abiding love through Jesus Christ, our resurrected and living Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. I invite you to share a sign or words of God's peace with those around you. I invite you to be seated. We continue now with the giving of our offerings. Uh, many of you give uh, electronically. Some of you might want to give electronically. There's instructions in the back of the pews for that. Thank you for your generosity. It truly makes everything that we do in and through this congregation possible. Please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. 
It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, and with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. It is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. It is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. The kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated with those serving communion. Come forward and get ready at this time. This is also the time for those of you worshiping online to gather your bread and your wine or grape juice. Eat the bread as you hear these words. The body of Christ given for you. And drink the wine or the grape juice as you hear these words, the blood of Christ shed for you. For those of you in the sanctuary, there will be two stations at the front of the center aisle. Beginning with the center sections, I invite you to come down the center aisle here. When you get to the front, you'll be able to take a small piece of bread or a gluten-free cracker. Go ahead and eat that. Then you'll have the opportunity to take a small glass of either red wine or white grape juice. Go ahead and drink that. Place your empty cups in the wooden bowls. Go back to your places by way of the side aisles. Side section, same procedure. It works best if you leave by way of the wall side. Come around down the center aisle and then back through those inside aisles. Here at St. Andrews, we practice an open table. You are all welcome to receive the true presence of Jesus in bread and wine of this holy meal. Welcome to communion.
Please stand for the blessing. And now may the blessing of God and the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in His grace and His truth and His life now and forever. Amen. This next song actually comes out of the old green hymnal, uh, so you're not going to be able to watch, uh, although I think I, I have a graphic of it up there, I think. Click. I think we got it. Go in peace, serve the Lord.